I was born in Dixon, Illinois, but uh, apparently didn't like it. I left at the age of 18 months and moved to Bluffton, Indiana, a little town on outskirts of Fort Wayne. And uh, I lived there until I was nine. My brother was four and a half years younger than I. And uh, so at nine, then we moved to this town where I spent my uh, adolescence, Elwood, Indiana, which is about 20 miles from Indianapolis. And started building model airplanes before I went to kindergarten. My father, before I could read, my father would read instructions. Starting from the age of nine, I was sent to summer camps uh, all through my adolescence and ended up working in them, being a lifeguard, running a waterfront, uh, being a water safety instructor. I was taken to the piano at about five or six and given lessons and took lessons until I was about ten, I guess. Played uh, musical instruments, was in the band, played the French horn in the local little high school orchestra and then played the drums when we marched because French horns don't like to be jiggled on your mouth. And uh, then had a couple of little tiny, as we called them then, dance bands, little four or five person bands. My mother was a wonder, really a wonderful golfer, and, uh, and she played around the state as well, just for fun. And uh, so I could always find my father in his store and my mother playing golf, whatever, but she was a stay-at-home mother who took very, very good care of us, taught us a lot, and helped me with Latin, everything else from her own textbooks. My father was an older guy. He was about 40 when I was born. My mother was about over 13 years younger than he. And he'd been uh, an adult and assistant manager of one of these penny stores before he even went to uh, the army and went to Europe in World War I and then came back and met and married my mother. He was really a, kind of an Edwardian chap. I mean, he uh, could tell when summer had come because he d discarded his vest. And he was a bit formal. I called him Sir, uh, affectionately. What New York City is to people in this part of the world, Chicago was to us. We would go up uh, on the train, as a matter of fact, in those days. And we would stay at the Palmer House. And my father, he would stand behind me and to the snickers of these clerks and whatnot. He'd make me check us in and he'd make me check the bill as we left before it was paid. And the hotel clerks were hilariously, you know, thought it was hilarious, but on the other hand, they could see I was being trained. <laughs> and then they had wonderful jazz. My mother would take me actually to jazz clubs because they were existed there and on Randolph Street in Chicago. Great jazz center and uh, at the time, and, and she would even take me, even though I was just a teenager, she would explain patiently to the doorman, whatever, that I was her son, that I was interested in music, and she'd con them into just saying, come in, and I was underage, she said, I will see to it he drinks Coca-Cola, <laughs> whatever. 44, when I joined the Navy, I was still 17, but I talked my father into it. Young men at the age of 18 were drafted at that point, still World War II was going on. But he wasn't an easy sell, I told him what I'd like to do. So in the logic, I said, if I stay and get drafted, I'm going to end up an infantry soldier. So I'd like to quit school and join the Navy. Got into the officer training program in the Navy Air Corps. The GI Bill made it all possible because when I got out of the Navy, it was I had friends who were, you know, making plans also to go into go back to college or go to college. I was very familiar with with the Bloomington campus of Indiana University and came out of the Navy with, I think, 75 academic credits, so I was already a junior. And um, so it turned out that they had a fairly good business school, as those places go, I guess. I was born in Evansville, Indiana, uh, which is the southernmost tip of Indiana, just across the Ohio River from Kentucky. And I have a mother, had a mother and father, and a sister who was four and a half years younger. Both of my parents went to uh, university. My mother to Washington University in St. Louis, and my father to um, Columbia in uh, Missouri.
And uh, my father was a football player. <laughs> my mother uh, was to take a trip with my aunt to Paris to see the fashions because my aunt was a uh, fashion designer. And um, she was taking my mother to Paris to uh, see the fashions. And uh, my mother met my father and she eloped. My aunt was somewhat of a powerhouse and uh, then uh, went to St. Louis from Washington, Missouri to begin her career. I spent a lot of time with my aunt. When it was time for me to go to college, uh, my aunt was very interested in my going to Fontbonne College. It is adjacent to Washington University in St. Louis. I made a big effort to transfer from there to Indiana University. There, uh, very shortly after I arrived at Indiana University, I met Jack. I met Jack I, in a cafe, one of those college town coffee shops, really. And uh, I happened in with a friend, and he was with one of my uh, sorority sisters from Evansville. And, they, and he had just come back from St. Louis, where he had been with some of his Navy friends. He then asked me what I was studying, and I told him I was studying sculpture under uh, Robert Laurent. And uh, then, surprisingly enough, he appeared in that class too. And I was really surprised that he did because he was a business major at Indiana University. We were sitting in the equivalent of our college town cafes here, and someone introduced me to Jane, and I liked her. And I said, what courses is she taking? She said, sculpture. I said, me too. And I went over and registered. It was Robert and, and Henry Hope, the chairman of the art department at Indiana University, who saw the uh, Jack's great talent. He could shake his hands and designs would come out. Laurent made me a kind of an assistant right away. And after one term, asked me if I would be an assistant of his up in his school in Maine, in Agunquit, Maine. And Laurent encouraged me to become a professional sculptor. Henry Hope, the chairman, said that uh, there was an opening for a teaching assistantship at Cornell, and a very good deal, and uh, they could uh, very well see to it that I got that job if I would take it. I said, yes, sir, don't ask me again, I accept. We married June 9th, 1950, at Indiana University, and were married by the university chaplain. We re immediately after our marriage got on a train and came to Ithaca. So, got here and um, oddly enough started to teach right away because the man I had come to assist had decided to take off so Victor Colby was here, and he'd only graduated two years before. He was a, got the first MFA, and I got the second MFA given in sculpture. So Victor and I looked at each other and muttered things about the blind leading the blind. We split up the two classes. I taught one, and he taught another. So um, I taught full time while I was a graduate student. Uh, he was very talented, very energetic, and uh, very well organized. And uh, I don't know what I would have done without it. Finished my work at Cornell in two years, and uh, uh, Jane and I just moved to New York. Jack was determined, uh, and I was determined for him, uh, that we should make our way in New York City. We knew that it was critical, that if he wanted to have any reputation or have his art take him anywhere, we had to go to the city. So uh, at the end of the two years, we packed up what little uh, possessions we had, but we packed up all the sculpture. And then I didn't have a job that first many, many months, almost a year. Jane supported the family. And then I got a, a job designing pottery uh, for a factory out in Staten Island, just being the designer. Then I got a job as an account executive in an advertising agency in New York for four years after that pottery thing. And I made enough money to cast things in bronze. 
after six years in Manhattan, uh, I'd had some job offers from two or three places, Ohio and, oh, uh, let's see, Berkeley, and I think it was Phillips Academy in Andover. And uh, I called uh, my old pal, Victor Colby, told him I was really thinking I was going to go back teaching. And uh, any chance there was anything going on up there? And he said, I think there is. He said, I'll call you back in a day or so. And so, oddly enough, uh, he didn't call me back, but uh, the chairman then, John Hertel, called me back and offered me a job. That was in 1958. And I've never... Uh, achieved the uh, escape velocity somehow to get out of the gravitational pull of Cornell in all these years. <laughs> yeah. We settled into Ithaca, blizzards and all. I was very, very fortunate in uh, coming at the time I did because we had uh, just a remarkable group of people here, including Nabokov and so forth, and J. O. Mahoney, who was uh, on the, in the art faculty, uh, had good friends amongst the, the literati here, and, uh, and I found myself uh, lunching two, three, four times a week with this group of people who ran the English department and the history department and the philosophy department and so forth, and I was just 31 when I came here. And, um, and I was running around with all these guys about 20 years older than I. But it was a very good competitive conversational battlefield at those lunches. At one point, you know, when they were building the new library, the librarian at the time asked me, he said they'd like a major sculpture out by the library. What would I suggest? And I said, well, Lipschitz would be a great choice. And then the Uris brothers, who were been so generous to Cornell, we got them up there and, and uh, got Lipschitz up there at the same time. And uh, Lipschitz not only said he'd supervise the casting of a cast of the Song of the Vowels, he said, but you really need something here in the atrium of the library. And then he talked the Uruses into giving a cast of the bather. So anyway, Lipschitz came up about three different times. We sighted the piece, we got a crane, held it up where we wanted it. and got walkie-talkies and he would go up in the upper floors of the buildings and we placed it perfectly and then built that column uh, that holds it up. We got two major sculptures and there they sit to this day. Under Malat, I was sent to do this three-month exploratory trip around South America to visit the museum directors and the cultural ministers and the artists. And I left under Malat, came back under Perkins. Three of us, Joe Stiko, Steve Muller, and I were summoned to Perkins' house and said, well, this all sounds good. You guys wanted to make a uh, painting exhibition, maybe bring some music, he said, but let's put it off a year and let's, and he coined the word right there, let's create the Cornell Latin American year and have a whole lot of conferences and really make a big thing of it. And we published a fine book uh, uh, on the catalog of the show. And so this really was, a, was quite a project. When I first came back to Ithaca, sculpture was two rooms in the basement of Franklin, and um, I didn't like that. And uh, since I was a, had been here as a uh, student, I used to go over to the foundry when the engineers owned it, and they were pouring, making steel about twice a semester and pouring cast iron pieces and things. And I found out it was going to be vacated and torn down because they built the new buildings over in the engineering quad at that time. So I uh, asked my dean if I could make, with his blessings, some inquiries as to perhaps getting that building. At that time, I was working rather closely with then President Malott, so I talked to him about it. And, uh, and he said, well, it sounds pretty good. He said, why don't you, uh, it doesn't have to be torn down. He said, why don't you make me a uh, you know, model of what you do with it in a presentation, so forth. So I got some architecture students who were in my class. We made a very good model, a contour model of the, of the building. And, um, and I remember he growled at me and he said, don't paint it white the way these architects do. I want it painted the color it's going to be. <laughs> and so I painted it the way it's been for a hundred and some years since the Civil War. And uh, so he liked it and uh, said he'd let me know. And then after about a month, I got a call from him 
And he said, you're a lucky young fellow. He said, I, uh, I just came back from seeing the physicists. They wanted a million dollars for some project or other. And I, with great effort, got them 850000 I went over to tell them this morning. And they practically hissed and booed. He said, so they didn't appreciate it all. And he said, and all you want is this modest amount of money to fix up that building. He said, so you've got it. But then about 10 or 15 years ago, I got historic designation for it, so it can't be torn down. <laughs> but it's doing pretty well for a building that was, that antedated the three original buildings, because half of it was the uh, blacksmithy for fabricating metal parts when they built the three original buildings. That's how I got historic designation for it, because it was the oldest continually operating foundry in the whole region up here since 1864 or something like that. But the sculpture program can go on and on as long as we have that building. And we have also, we've built a bronze casting facility behind the big building. And uh, we cast, oh, we do as many as 10, 15 pours a semester out there. Make a lot of bronzes. And students like it, and we like it, and it's quite an instructive experience for them. Jack has always been interested in making sure that the foundry remains a sculpture facility. If Jack hadn't been here, there would be no foundry today. I think the university owes him a great debt in having this space and keeping it functioning all these years. Jack and I had a wonderful opportunity to do something really great for the students in the College of Architecture, Art and Planning, and that was to start and establish the Rome program. I was uh, uh, sort of running the search committee that found uh, Bill McMinn, and we hired him to be our dean. Bill has always adored Rome and spent a lot of time there, and we got talking and he, and he said he would just love if we could get a branch in Rome. So uh, Roberto Einaudi, his father was uh, the head of our international studies program and founded it here. And Roberto grew up here and in Italy and uh, was equally at home both places. So we were able to get a very good deal on a lease in the Palazzo Massimo. And it, it had a Peruzzi painting on the, in the main, the biggest room on the, on the ground floor. And so I took the first class over and um, we had oh, about seven or eight art students and about 14 or 15 architecture students. And that's a satisfaction that we did that. It was a good job. We're still pleased with ourselves about that little project. Fast forward uh, to the early uh, 2000s, and there was an initiative at the university to separate fine arts from architecture and planning with the thought that it, it might be better located with the art history department. Uh, Jack had a strong view that that was not the appropriate activity for fine arts, and so did I. And Jack and myself, with a small group of trustees, actually worked to convince the administration, as we ultimately did, uh, that the future of the fine arts department within the university was better housed with architecture and planning. In 2005, Jack retired from almost 50 years of teaching at Cornell University. I'm luckier than people who have children because I have had all these students and I acknowledge all the really good ones and I forget the others. <laughs> Jack gave as a teacher uh, with the generosity that a parent gives to a kid. He looked out for all of us. Uh, he didn't have any children of his own, but he had lots of children, lots of 18, 20 year old children. Uh, like myself. Jack would hook you with um, a, a, an observation of the moment, something somebody was doing, something that had happened the day before. He would, uh, he would usually cast a bit of humor over it um, and, and sort of draw you in and put you at ease. And then what do you all think about this, or what do you all think about that? And one of those what do you think abouts was of course the plantation project. Right before I moved to Ithaca, I had done a 10-foot concrete 
commission, sculpture commission for a wonderful collector named Lois Orswell up in Pomfret, Connecticut. And so I'd done this great big piece for her, flanked on the one side by a huge bronze color and the other side by a big David Smith overlooking a 40-acre field, a very pretty sight. She was a wonderful patron. So I developed a slight taste for monumental <laughs> concrete sculptures, so I kept trying to figure out how I could do them again. Well, I ran into this bunch of students who were in my classes. They were all architects, fourth and fifth year architects, one graduate student. Jack has always advocated something that I feel is very important, which is collaboration between artists and architects. He has always encouraged architectural students to take sculpture courses. We had our class in our junior year do uh, plaster, large-scale plaster sculptures on the site which is now the Johnson Art Museum site. It was the seed that made him think about in the following year uh, doing something more permanent in some place where we could cast concrete and really build truly monumental sculptures. After some research he found this abandoned site behind a barn and the old plantations and figured this was a site nobody cared about. He got them to agree that indeed we could experiment there. I globbed onto that in a heartbeat because it was very architectural in nature. Um, I think Jack knew that and, and so consequently was able to excite us into really, you know, uh, uh, pursuing this. And Jane set up a table and a tablecloth and brought out the wine and uh, bread <laughs> and refreshments and cheese and we all had a great party uh, uh, when, when we had poured the last concrete and it was uh, finally in place. And I recall him explaining to Webb Nichols, to Alan Chimikoff and myself, we we're all going to collaborate on this piece together, which was Jack's idea. He said, this is very simple. You make a model of what you want to do. If I think it's OK, we'll go forward. And then the grading is even more simple. If it stands up and it's done by the end of the term, you get an A. Otherwise, you get an F. <laughs> We'd set everything up uh, out in the, in the plantations. The formwork was there. The concrete truck came. Uh, and they poured uh, the stuff into the formwork. They poured all the concrete in. And then we all went over to Jack's house. And there was a lot of celebrating at Jack's, uh, Jack and Jane's house. Uh, and especially when we were celebrating, first completing the pour of this thing, and then a couple of weeks later, after we assembled uh, the pieces, there was a, another great celebration. Fred Bebesheimer, Stuart Carter, Alan Chimikoff, Ted Graves, Roberto Inaudi, Randy Lewis, Kent Moore, Michael Newman, Webb Nichols, Charlie Rogers, Brewster Ward. A little later on, uh, this wonderful man Newman, who's given chairs and the women's gym and all sorts of things to the university, uh, decided to give, I think it was two or three million dollars to landscape that area and make those little artificial lakes around it. So although this project started out in a piece of disused property now is the middle of a beautiful park in the plantations and uh, everybody likes it. One of the things that I really appreciate about Jack and Jane is their affection and openness and candor. And I went back through my letters and papers and looked at some of the notes that Jack had sent me, not a lot, but in the 80s he sent me a note that in the end said, come see us. And I knew that if I ever found my way to Palm Beach Gardens, that they would be there open and laughing, questioning, excited about my presence. The thing about Jack was A, he was enthusiastic and encouraging. So if you did something, there was somebody there who was supporting you. But beyond that, he also had an interest in his own work. He was, uh, he was productive. Uh, so 
his, uh, his influence at, at a point in my stay there was, was pretty damn critical. I can say that the, the, um, the devotion to the craft of making sculpture uh, was something that I, I picked up from Jack. If I had to uh, talk about one thing about Jack Squire, it would be that it was possible for somebody to be a sculptor because he was a sculptor, he devoted his life to it, and he devoted his life to teaching also, which I think is a very critical thing. Jack said to me once, he said, I want to influence how you think. That will influence your work. Jack was always a great advisor on just about anything. And that has continued for the last 40 years. I remember just thinking, he's telling me everything. He's, he's, he's letting me in. He's giving me the secrets. I understood the gifts he was giving me in the, at the moment he was giving them to me. I didn't, it didn't take me 10 years to go, oh, God, I can't believe what I learned. I mean, I was getting it. And so I was incredibly respectful of of what he offered me. I remember uh, the first time I met Jack as also actually being very consistent with who he was for me over the next uh, course of years as a student. The first time I met Jack, he extended his hand to me and greeted me warmly and also in a very, <clears throat> a very big way that Jack carried himself. He was very poised and it was Jack knowing that I needed to be comfortable. He was inviting me in, and he sat down in his chair, and he, he gestured to this chair, and he crossed his leg in the way Jack does. And <clears throat> it was just a nice, warm, personal conversation. And <clears throat> that's who Jack has always been for me. I became a lawyer, and we talked about why that was a good thing, because it freed you up to, to actually to, to do art without having to worry about selling it. It was okay to be an artist just to do the art. It was okay to work for, uh, for a living and do art just for the sake of doing the art. I have to say that Jack being the kind of person he was, he, he left a mark on, on me in many, in many ways. Jack was the kind of professor that you could talk to uh, that that almost you could go and have a beer with after, after class and he would not balk at it and he didn't keep a kind of distance between the students and himself. To the best of my knowledge he would have been the only professor that was there in, in my years at Cornell that you call by his first name. His studio was, was also like a haven he could go in there whenever you wanted. He, if he was working, he would stop unless he was so deep into something, and he would just wave you off, and you knew that you were being waved off, and that was okay because he was uh, committed to something that he was working on. But more often than not, and so you'd sit down in a dusty chair, uh, and you'd sit down and just yak for a while. The one time I really saw some emotion from him. Uh, I was back at Cornell about 10 years ago visiting and we were sitting in his studio and I said, Jack, you know, I finally have a child. I have a son. And he said, oh, that's wonderful. That's great. What, you must be 50 years old. I was, in fact, 52 already, but I was very thrilled to have a son. And I said, Jack, and do you know what his name is? And he said, no, what's his name? And I said, his name is Jack. And I think I saw a little tear in his eye or something, some show of emotion that I had never seen before. He in fact sent my Jack a sculpture, a beautiful wooden sculpture to commemorate his birth. Jack has produced sculpture since 1948 and I made a catalog of every sculpture that he made and where they were exhibited, who acquired them, actually a provenance of each of the pieces.
Having gone there in 52, I then uh, took my work to the downtown gallery, which was the best gallery for American art in the country at the time. And uh, uh, Edith Halpert, who ran it, took me on, amazingly enough. Every important American artist was in the downtown gallery. I was 25 years old at the time. And um, so that was my first gallery. Well, the Ithaca College uh, project, uh, uh, Howard Dillingham uh, and his wife, Dorothy, a painter, good painter, uh, built the current Ithaca College campus from its beginnings as a farm. And uh, so he'd seen, they'd seen a, an exhibition of mine in New York and uh, a piece I'd done there, they asked if by any chance I could make a big version of it for the center of the campus. And, um, and Howard had found a donor for, for, a, for a monumental sculpture that's not easy to do and also he was willing to do a big reflecting pool for this piece as well. I have five pieces in the Hirshhorn Museum in Washington. I've got a couple pieces in the Whitney. I've got some pieces in the, uh, small pieces in the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, and various museums around the country. I moved from uh, rather, you know, abstract pieces based on oceanic and pre-Columbian primitive art to uh, smoother and slicker and a more Brancusi inspired kind of abstractions later working in resins, working in marble, working in wood, uh, uh, then to some rather large-scale things and then moved on to uh, uh, finally after when I was, oh, I must have been 50 or so before I'd ever even made a figurative sculpture. And then after a spell of 10 and 15 years of figurative sculpture, I went back to more abstractions and um, that's more or less where I am now, except that I am now, for the first time since I was a graduate student, starting to paint. He did these, what I thought were wonderful sculptures. They had this, they were, um, they seemed to me to be both uh, formally very strong, and at the same time, they had this wonderful sensual erotic quality about them. They had the, almost the veiled references to uh, I guess genitalia and, and, uh, and uh, body parts. I can remember standing in the foundry, peering into his studio and looking at his work, which was very clever, very abstract and interesting, but I sort of took it for granted. But today, when I reflect on his work from my own personal experience and my life experience, I realize how erotic, how vulnerable and how powerful his work was and is. And it amazes me that all of that escaped this 22-year-old student in 1963. Jane and Jack had some of the early uh, models from Jack's sculptures. And Jane and Jack said, look, we would like Cindy and you to have these models uh, from my early sculptures, which is, I thought, was a terribly uh, touching thing and we were very thankful for. In 1993, Jack had a one-man exhibition, a retrospective of 40 years of his sculpture and teaching at Cornell. They were just a stylish couple and as young students you you sort of looked up to somebody who is a bit akin to a movie star in terms of uh, lifestyle and appearance. Jack and Jane were, I think in the opinion of all of us, the artists, the architects, sort of the, the coolest couple at Cornell. Jack and Jane epitomized cool to us in the late 50s. And we went to their house and they served wine and nuts. That's why I always serve wine and nuts because that was what the squires served to us then. So they, were, they epitomized cool for us and not only taught us uh, the academic subjects but also how to live. You couldn't miss Jack and Jane, always very well groomed. 
a white 140 Jag convertible. When you saw Jack and Jane on the campus, you knew someone had arrived. Lord Goodrich, the director of the Whitney Museum, recommended me to go to this conference. And, um, it, and there were a number of, of, and it was then hosted basically by the uh, UNESCO group, which dealt with the plastic arts. So I became sort of the US representative to these things, which is rather interesting. And um, we traveled, and um, it's definitely made an enormous difference to my understanding of, of art, and enormous help in my teaching, and uh, just a lot of fun. Great trips everywhere. We've gotten bombed at, shot at, uh, stoned, uh, <laughs> all sorts of things in weird places, uh, but um, survived it all. Jack and uh, J.O. Mahoney were the only members of the art faculty who ever designed their own houses. <laughs> when we moved to Ithaca, we bought a house uh, over in uh, the other side of town, which was an unfinished house. We finished it up and uh, enjoyed having it for three or four years, but we'd wanted very, very much to design and build our own house. We'd talked about it since before we were married. So we took a year off and designed and built this house, and we'd always both adored the work of Mies van der Rohe. And uh, so uh, Jane did the working drawings for this house, the heating, the wiring, everything like that. And uh, so we designed it and built it ourselves. I consider it one of my Big sculptures, to say the least, and uh, built it in 65, moved in in 66. Every piece I've always made, or made since I've had this house, I'd think, well, if anything, if I don't sell it, it'll go there, <laughs> and uh, so forth. And so this, this, I built this house partly as a gallery for my own work. We divide our time between Ithaca and Florida. We spend half the year in Ithaca and half the year in Florida. We like Ithaca. Ithaca is really the home. Jack and I had three boats in our lifetime. We had the first one was Tesoro, which we kept in St. Thomas. And after that, we got the manatee, uh, which we first brought to Ithaca, and then Jack and I alone took that boat to all the way down to Florida, where it is today. We missed having a boat in Ithaca, so we got a sloop, about a 22-foot sloop, as we kept up there and uh, for about 10 years enjoyed it. Cougar Lake's a nice, nice place for a small boat and uh, very sporty. <laughs> Storms come whipping down that lake in a very serious way, but uh, it's just a uh, just a silly excess, really, and not practical in any way, but I enjoy working on it, and uh, that takes, you know, I like working with my hands, and believe me, you get plenty of opportunity if you have a traditionally uh, teak trimmed, varnished boat uh, to work with your hands, and we enjoy it very much. It's kind of like a little beach house. But also, Jane and I wanted to do things like travel, and wanted to build houses, and have boats, and do whatever and whatever, so we we uh, took some time out here and there and built up to all together 37 <laughs> rental houses and things like this so that we could you know do all these things well starting when when I was a graduate student uh, I had a 1948 TCMG which is a great classic now and uh, but uh, that was a car I liked a lot and it was nice up there in the hills and there weren't many around. Uh, Jay O'Mahony had one and I had one and that was it. We were the whole foreign car contingent in Tompkins County I guess. And then just one thing led to another and I, I liked Jaguars so I ended up having three of them over about a 40 year period. I remember him talking about his Jaguar and I said that car must be really fast and he said you know it is fast but the nice thing is the best part about it is that you know it's fast. You don't have to drive it fast. You just know it's fast, and the car tells you it's fast. And that's what's cool about it. The students liked them, and they were always sitting out there, and uh, every now and then, I'll have contact with someone and say, well, I remember your old whatever, and he'll mention a certain car that we had. So. But uh, just a silly way to waste money. <laughs> He 
he was engaged in all uh, artistic activities and he was just bright as could be. So that was it for me, right then and there. <laughs> we met and when we met, uh, we were together every day after that, forever, until this day. <laughs> We really do everything together, and we always have. We design furniture, we design showrooms, we design ceramics, we modeled. I wouldn't become a sculptor if I hadn't met Jane, probably, but I certainly wouldn't have remained one all this time. She's encouraged me at all times. She's subsidized me and uh, been patient enough to put up with this curious social standing of being a, in quotes, artist. Jack had no intention of becoming a, a sculptor. His interests had always been in many of the arts, but not in sculpture, until he came to this class with uh, Robert Laurent. The combination of, of really liking music and then also really loving to make things, model airplanes that flew and all these things, I learned to carve wood and all that stuff. I was always in that sense interested in art, but I didn't even know there was, you could be a sculptor. I don't know, I thought all the statues of generals on horses had been made. My nephew once asked me, what attracted you to Jack? And I said, I'm sure he thought I was going to say his good looks. Of course, that helped a lot, <laughs> but it was his mind. He had many, many strings to his bow, and he always knew he could rely on himself. And that was wonderful. And I think that's something that he conveyed to, as a very young man, to all of his Cornell students. I think they all felt it. And even as Joel Perlman said in his book to Jack, he said, you showed us the way. <laughs>